Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. On my ordination day, we celebrated the next day what we call the first Mass. And of all the readings in Scripture that we had to choose from, that was the focus of my first reading, the reading from the prophet Isaiah. It very significant for me. He has sent me to bring glad tidings to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, release to the prisoners, and to announce a year of favor from the Lord, a day of vindication. I chose that because I guess through my studies and through growing up in my particular family, those words took, took flesh. Those words were real. And if I was going to be a priest, I couldn't just be an ordinary person, priest. I had to be someone who had a mission. It was my my thoughts, my reflection. But the mission was based on role models in my own family. If I think of my mother Rose and Frank, my father, we were Jersey City people, downtown Jersey City people. My father was very involved with the parish. My mother was even more so involved with the parish. And she was on every committee you could have, whatever it was, whatever, collection, Christmas, Thanksgiving, all that stuff. But she also took it on herself very often through the various organizations she she was part of, Knights of Columbus, she was a Columbiad, Catholic War veterans, my father never fought, but my uncles did, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, and the list goes on. If there was something in the neighborhood that needed to be taken care of, we were a close-knit neighborhood, multicultural, before the word was popular. We were multicultural. We had black people next to us. Across the street, we had Latinas. Over here, we had Italians. We we had a three-family house with various people in it. And if there was a fire, say, in the neighborhood, my mother would be the first to make some calls. Okay, we we gotta help you know, Mary and Joe, because they, they just had a fire in their house, and it's near Christmas, and we have to get some toys. And she would start the process. She would start the ball rolling. And Michael and I observed this. My brother and I observed this, you know. And my father would be the first one there to be delivering stuff and running over and helping people. And if there were food issues, everything. She was there. She was there. Those are personality. But I thought it was normal. I thought it was... Didn't everybody do this? We didn't. I mean, the kids didn't. We helped here and there. But she was the, she was the one, and that's why on the wall in her living room, there was a, a series of plaques from every Tom, Dick, and Harry you can imagine, thanking her, appreciating her, and all that stuff. So when, when it was time for me to respond to the Lord, and it, it took a while in my education to really respond and say, I want to be, be, be a priest, Isaiah impressed me. You can't do anything without the Spirit of God, believe me. But once we allow ourselves to accept the Holy Spirit, then we become anointed, chosen, to do his mission, to do the mission of Jesus who became a human being on this earth. There's a big controversy in Rome, right? I shouldn't say in Rome, in the media about the beautiful nativity that Pope Francis decided to have erected at the Vatican. Yeah, Bambino Gesù is there, and Joseph and Mary, and all the the, the right people. But around that nativity, in life-size sculptures, are the corporal works of mercy. Feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, bury the dead, visit the imprisoned. It's no accident. He chose those images, not only from Isaiah, but from Jesus himself, who tells us, you feed somebody, you fed me. You clothe somebody, you're clothing me. You give drink to someone, you're giving me drink. Because the controversy is, oh, we want to to see baby Jesus, we want more little baby Jesus, we want the shepherds, we want the lambs, we want all that happy stuff that goes with what we think Christmas is all about. But he shocked us and punched us right in the belly, the world, for telling us what Christmas is all about. Isaiah says it, to heal the brokenhearted, 
to bring tidings to the poor, to proclaim liberty and release to prisoners. My first years of ministry were at DePaul High School and then William Patterson High School, and, excuse me, William Patterson University, and I can't tell you the number of things the students did. Thank God I was there to be inspired to push them to feed the hungry and give drink to the thirsty and collect food and collect gifts for the holidays. Every day of the week, some ministry was being practiced through the Catholic campus ministry at William Patterson where we were there. Monday, they went to the nursing home. Tuesday, they taught religious ed to the, the handicapped kids. Wednesday, they went to another place to tutor kids. Thursday was the soup kitchen. And it went on and on and on and on. It was normal for me because, and I'm not saying anything special, I'm, I'm anyone special, because the Spirit of the Lord is upon us and encourages us to feed the hungry and bring tidings of joy to other people, especially those who need it. Here we are on Joy Sunday. Now, you know, I'm not going to take a, I should take a poll. Should I take, I'm going to take a poll. Okay, by show of hands, by show of hands, from the October, because you know it started then, and obviously to December 25th, how many of you are perfectly satisfied with the way you have prepared for Christmas? How many of you are very dissatisfied with what has happened around you, the way the world is preparing for Christmas? Ah, uh, ah, uh, you get it? That's the purpose of hope. That's the purpose of this Sunday. Paul encourages us to wake up and rejoice. The prophets do it. And of course, Mary. In her Magnificat, the, the psalm that is the responsorial psalm is Magnificat. And I love to say at least the first phrase in, in the Latin. Magnificat anima mea. It's great. Magnificat, Latin construction, to make great. Anima mea, my soul. Magnificat anima mea Deo. My soul magnifies the Lord. She was so wrapped up with her faith in God and confused. Don't, don't worry, don't, don't be mistaken. She did not have a clear picture of what was going on in her body as she went and visited Elizabeth pregnant. Or when the angel appeared to her and said, hey, you're going to have a baby and it's going to be the greatest thing since, since creation. She was confused. And in that confusion, I'm sure there was stress. Now we're going to start identifying with the conflict that goes on celebrating the joy of the message of Jesus and the stress that goes on because of the world around us. We know what we're supposed to be about. We do know that here. But somehow the world pushes us in the wrong direction sometimes. And sometimes we just flow along and go the way the world goes. And so we're upset that we're burning our cookies. So we're upset that the lights aren't working. Or we're upset that, oh, they ran out of that special gift. Or we're upset about, hey, it's not your birthday anyway. Who cares if you're upset? Because your lights went out or your cookies were burnt or your guests who you expected did not respond, or they brought a stranger along. That's life. We are unique in life because we follow the incarnate Son of God. We follow Jesus Christ, the Word of God made flesh, announced by John the Baptist, that even amidst all of the conflict of life, Joy is our message. Because we have Jesus. We have Jesus within us and available to us. And all the other stuff that goes by the wayside, we have to let, let it go by the wayside. I like a nice party. I like a nice dinner. I like a nice decoration. But whose party is it? Whose birthday is it? And we're here 
to get the full meaning of Christmas. Don't you want to throw up sometimes when they say, oh, the, the real meaning of Christmas, and then they, you know, they show you a car. Oh, the real meaning of Christmas is some expensive gift. The real, the true meaning of Christmas is some other nonsense. The true meaning of, just, of Christmas is Jesus who put into words and action, he has sent me to bring glad tidings to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, release to prisoners, and the favor of God for all people. The real message of Christmas is us living the message of Jesus and being John the Baptist's heralds of that message to the world. Even amidst house burning down, a flood, a serious loss, unemployment, addiction, that's the world. And the world would love to control you and me and say, forget the meaning of Christmas, Jesus taking care of the poor and sending us to love other people and to take care of those in need. Forget that. Come on, the real meaning of Christmas is greed and how much you can accumulate. We know it's not true. But yet the questions come to us. You know, poor John the Baptist, he was... He was a wild man. I mean, all, all, all theology says that he was, he was a little wild. He was out there. <clears throat> he was an Essene, probably, which is like a her, hermit community around, around uh, the Holy Land, in the Holy Land, near the uh, Qumran. And he learned something. The Holy Spirit hit him somehow and said, you're going to be the one to announce the coming of the Messiah. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> he's in the desert. We know from last week's readings what he wore, camel skin, a leather belt around his waist, ate honey and locusts. He ate things of the earth. And he's confronted. He's doing good stuff. He's confronted for doing his good stuff, as we should be. When you do good, you should be confronted by the world. Barrage of questions. Why are you doing this? Who are you? Uh, in whose name are you doing this? If, if you're not the Baptist, I mean, if you're not the Messiah, you're not Elijah, you're not this one and this one, why are you doing those? Why are you doing good? And that question wasn't to John. That question's to us. Why are you doing good? Why are you healing the brokenhearted and bringing hope to other people? And if you're not, God forbid... Why are you even here? We came to follow the light, Jesus Christ. We are a church of compassion. We are a church of sharing. We are a church who looks at the nativity outside the Vatican and say, ain't pretty picture, beautiful sculptures, but it ain't a pretty picture. But it's true, a true picture. We need to clothe the naked and give drink to the thirsty and collect, because we're people in a secular world, collect gifts for the poor at Christmas and Thanksgiving and all year long, yes. Because our task is from, from Isaiah to bring the good tidings to the poor. And I, I like to reference Mary, who also refers to the mystery of what we're here for. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent empty away because he has compassion on his servant Israel. He knocked the rich off their horses. And let's be clear on this. God doesn't dislike rich people, but he certainly dislikes, I presume, I'm going to speak on behalf of God, he certainly dislikes greed. He certainly dislikes apathy. He certainly dislikes prejudice. He certainly dislikes hatred. That's why we have Mary saying, hey, he's going to knock you people off your high horses and he's going to lift up the lowly and he's going to give the lowly good things. Let's not talk economy. Let's talk about soul. Let's talk about attitude. We who are lowly, we who are dedicated to God, hopefully really experiencing the true joy that we have because we have the Messiah. We have another week or so for Christmas preparation and all that. Don't worry about it. You do what you do, and just remember whose birthday we're celebrating. We're here because we're challenged by the Holy Scriptures, as Paul says, to never quench the Spirit. 
celebrate our faith. Celebrate the faith that we have in the one born in the flesh 2,000 years ago and who is with us today. And what are the questions we could be asked? Not by the prophets or the Pharisees from Jerusalem, but by the world. John was asked a whole bunch of questions, as you heard. What are the questions that we could be asked by the world? What are you doing to pre prepare for Christmas? How much have you spent on charity? What are you doing to feed the hungry? What is your preparation for Christmas? We are asked by the world. This is not me asking you, because I'm being asked the same question. The world looks to us, like Jerusalem was the world, you might say. The secular world is a religious world, but it was the secular world to John the Baptist. But the, the secular world asks us, the Christians, what are you doing to celebrate Christmas? What, what are you doing to really make it a celebration of the birth of the Prince of Peace? What, what are you doing? You're concerned about how you look on Christmas Day? You, you, you're concerned about the pretty outfits or the decorations? What, what are you doing? And the world says, do it this way. Do it secular way. Get rid of that little baby in the crib. Get rid of that Mary and Joseph. And definitely get rid of the whole concept of feeding the poor and clothing the naked and all those goofy statues of exquisite beauty around the Vatican's nativity set. Get rid of all that. Make it look nice. Make it look a bella figura. You know, put a big smile on it and put a Santa Claus and make your cheeks rosy and get ready for hell. 